right, here we are again at New Endings. My name is Darren, and I'll be your host today. Mariah is our producer, as usual. How are you today, Mariah? Hi, everyone. I am doing great. It's been a pretty good day. I had a great weekend. Excellent, excellent. You know, I was thinking, Mariah, we need we probably need to get you like a cool producer nickname or something. Oh, yeah. I've tried to think about nicknames and stuff, and I can't find one that sticks, you know? I was thinking uh, P. Mitty. P. Mitty? P. Mitty, yeah. <laughs> Would that make us hip if we use P. Mitty? Probably not. P. Mitty sounds like yeah, know, gangster. Probably, yeah, it'd probably be more stupid, <laughs> stupid than hip, I think. Well, great news on the new endings front today. We, uh, starting in a few weeks, we're going to be expanding the show to one hour. We've, we've had so much response from people listening that uh, they want to hear more, you know, because we've been having to cut it kind of short. Yeah. So we decided to add some more time. So I've been a little rushed with the guests lately, you know, trying to fit it all in. I want, them, I want the guests to be able to get their, their whole story out there because that's the important part. And uh, it'll give me, uh, you know, give me some time to give my opinion on it, give a little recap on what was said. So I think it'll, I think it'll be a good thing, don't you? Yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, yeah. You know, people have really great stories, so it's nice that they won't have to try to compact it really fast. Right, right, exactly. Well, there's just so much information. We just need to, I think we just need a little extra time. To, you know, like today, we're going to have Jennifer from Iowa on the show. She's going to talk about her meth addiction and uh, some family uh, abuse problems that, that carried right over into some uh, abusive relationships too. You know, Mariah, I think she's a Broken Chains member too. I think she's uh, an associate member like me. That's awesome. Yeah. She doesn't write either. She so, doesn't? No. So I guess <laughs> I'll I'm not, teach all of you. Oh, oh there you go. Well, <laughs> I guess I'm, it, it shows me I'm not alone, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, my best, you know, is at the tailor. You notice I'm not wearing it today. It's getting all the patches sh- sewn on finally, and uh, but they're a little backed up with all those high school letterman jackets. Oh, yeah, yeah. that is right. Yeah, those high schoolers, you know, <laughs> getting in the way of something really important, right? <laughs> It'll probably be three months before I get mine back, but uh seems like I've already Dang. been talking about this for three months. People yeah. are probably tr- getting tired of hearing about my best. <laughs> all right, well, P. Mitty, let's get, uh, let's get Jennifer on here. All righty. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Je- Jennifer, there you are. How are you I'm doing? Here. All right. Didn't you tell me you were uh, Broken Chains or Associate Broken Chains or something? I am. Oh, okay, good, good. I, I thought I remembered you talking about that, so I didn't want to misrepresent or anything. Now, no, I, just, I can't find my number, though. <laughs> totally oh, okay. Well, oh, man, that should be etched in your brain. Yeah. <laughs> it should be. Okay, well, I won't tell my Broken Chains friends, then. Don't worry. Yeah, don't tell Jeff. Uh, 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 yeah, definitely not him. All right, well, Jen, uh, this show, uh, you know, is all about uh, when we made our decision to, to change or flip, as we call it here. Uh, some people consider it hitting bottom. I kind of like to uh, concentrate on flipping uh, before we consider, you know, hitting bottom. Um, so why don't you start off by telling us uh, what that moment was in your life and, and how you came to, to know Melissa Dale, the, the Iowa State rep, and, and kind of tell us how that happened. Um, well, um, to start off, I, I guess I got busted. Um, cops showed up at my house to uh, check for a missing child. Um, I'm not sure why, but they did. Um, I asked them to wait outside so that I could tell somebody living in my basement who happened to be my dealer to put her dog away and when I came back the cops were in my house um, they found a pipe and they weren't going to leave until I gave them something else um, so I gave them what was in my room happened to be a few more pipes and about a quarter of meth um, they left, I left in handcuffs uh, they took me down the street um, got a ticket book out of his trunk and he wrote me a ticket for possession of mer- uh, methamphetamines and possession of paraphernalia. Mm. Um, he signed my ticket for me, um, and then they let me go. Wow. Um, I, walk- I walked back up to my house, which was about a half a block, and I sat down. Um, I got high one more time, and the next morning I was like, you know what, this is it. I can't do this. If they're watching my house, I've lost so much stuff. I've lost my best friend. Um, my family wasn't speaking to me, and so it was... That was my turning point, and I lost my house, and obviously I had to move. My landlord found out about it, and so I needed a new place to move to. I had all my stuff packed. I found an apartment, but I didn't have anybody to help me move. 
Um, and so as a last resort, I called Lutheran Church of Hope, and Melissa Dale opened, answered the phone, and she agreed to help me. Um, she sent me two wonderful angels, um, Linda and uh, my, oh my goodness, I can't even think of his name now. That's all right. Call him Sparky. Yeah, all right. And uh, they came, and uh, they showed up with a trailer and a truck. Nice. And they asked for nothing in return, but... She was telling me about Celebrate Recovery. Oh, okay. And she's like, just give it three times. I promise you it'll help you. Um, it took me about a month and a half before I finally called her up and said, okay, I'm ready to go. And she, Melinda took me, and she introduced me to Melissa. And Melissa was so caring and understanding, and she gave me this hug that I just, it brought tears to my eyes because nice. I'd never felt that kind of love and compassion from right. a stranger. Right. Um, so I did go to large group the first time. I did not go to small group because I did not feel comfortable. And I went back the next week and I went to large group. I was received with open arms um, and I walked into the small group and I started having panic attacks. So I, I left. Um, but the third time I came back, I went to large group and I went to small group. And I was shown so many people that had gone through things that I've been through right. when I thought I was all alone. That's the big thing about support groups is that you don't realize that uh, you're not the only one. Everybody thinks that their problem's the worst. And then they, they go to a Celebrate Recovery or some other support group and they realize, well, all these people are here for the same thing. So it makes it easy. But that taking that first step is like the, the hardest thing anybody can do. I always say that step one getting over denial is, is uh, the hardest step. I mean, I'm sure other people have their opinion of what the hardest step is, but walking into some place for the first time and thinking that you're nothing and all these mental things that are going on in your head and, and making that first step, that, that's really hard. But uh, yeah. obviously... Admitting I mm -hmm. had a problem was the hardest for me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, obviously some things, if you had your dealer living in your basement, that that's certainly an end to a story. So why don't we go back and kind of tell us what led up to all that? Go back and and tell us a, a little bit about your your childhood and what was going on there. How did you grow up? What kind of household was it? Um. So at age three, um, I remember the day that my mom walked out on us. Um. There were three of us kids. Um. I have an older sister who's two years older than I am, and I have a brother who's two years younger than I am. And my mom picked up my older sister from my grandma's house left me and my brother behind. Um, mm. My dad came and picked us up after he got off work, and we got to the house, and it was empty. Everything was gone except our clothes and mine and my brother's bed. Wow. Um, she just left us behind. Um, my dad raised us then until we were, I was six, and my mother signed over her rights to my stepmom, and so my stepmom adopted me. A short yeah. time later, my yeah. That mom then um, she got pregnant and a new baby was in the house. Okay. And I was no longer daddy's little princess. I became daddy's um, punching bag. Mm. And so my dad abused me from age eight till I was 15 when I finally just had had enough and I left. Right. I couldn't take it no more. I was tired of going to school with marks and bruises and my teachers were noticing and nobody said anything until one day when I showed up to school with a fresh hand print across my face. Oh, okay. Well, at least they said something at one point. I, so I, that was I, my I, point to move. I left. Mm -hmm. um, but you were kind of hiding my, it up to that point. Who was 18 got me an apartment, yeah. helped me get an apartment. Well, now back to when, you know, when you're being abused and, and you're having these marks, I mean, you were trying to hide it the whole time. I mean, you didn't want to turn your dad in or something, I guess, right? Yes. Okay. All right. So you, you you get it. So your high school days sound like they're a little rough, from what you've told me, right? Yes, um, I dropped out when I was a senior in high school. Um, I just I was trying to work. I was working full time to pay my bills um, as a waitress, right. and trying to go to high school at the same time. And I knew my bills were more important because if I didn't pay my bills, I'd be on the street and homeless. Right. Um, so I quit, and I ended up going to Job Corps. Okay. Uh, Box Elder Job Corps in um, Nemo, South Dakota, which is out in the Black Hills. All right. Um, I spent a year there. I got my high school diploma, and I got a receptionist um, trade Good. certificate. Okay. 
Well, that's about the time uh, you started this meth issue, right? I, mean, I started that about a, about six months after I graduated from there. Right. So what, were you like uh, 19 or something? I was 19, yeah. So, so that went on for how uh, many years? It did. Um, so I went from 19 until I was 40, but in that time I did have 10 years clean. Oh, I see. I, I was going to say, if you if you were from doing meth uh, from 9 to 40, you should be dead. You shouldn't be talking to us right now. So I, I guess that kind of helped out going on. Going clean yeah. For um, so I did. Yeah, uh, my best friend and I, we were addicted to meth together. Um, then we got clean together. Uh, we just stopped one day, and we got clean. And we had ten years clean. And then some things that had happened to me in those ten years. Um, well, I was raped at age sixteen right. um, by my high school sweetheart. Right. And then I was so it's I'm pretty so twelve twelve thir- no eleven years ago I was raped again by Mm. someone who I thought was my friend. Right. Um, He went off his psychotic medication, and he was drinking, and he showed up at my house thinking that something I said three weeks prior to that applied to that day, and he broke into my home, Um, and he raped me at gunpoint. Mm. Um, I was scared for my life. I would imagine. Where I lived. Yeah. I ended up moving. Uh, My roommate went with me, Um, and I had to... (laughs) do things that I never thought I would ever do in my life. I um, became an agoraphobic. Oh, from the... Which means... As a result from I, the... From, uh, I never left my house. That was due to the to the rape situation? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. So it scared you enough that you didn't want to leave the house. Right. Because he was doing things. Um, he found out where I moved to, and he trashed my car. And we moved again, and then we found dead animals on my car. Um, so we up and moved to Kansas City, so we got away from everything here to get a fresh start. Okay. I needed something new. Okay. Well, now... Um, when I mm-hmm. was in Kansas City, I was there for two years. Uh, my roommate came back here. He got a job offer that he couldn't refuse, and I understood that. Um, I came back from Kansas City, though, the end of 2012. Okay. And well, that's when I started using again. Okay. Well, you didn't have any support group or anything. You guys just kind of tried to quit on your own. Yep. Yeah, okay. Well, that's one of the biggest problems. I mean, it never ends. You need to have some some sort of support that you have other people to talk to and keep you on the right track. So that was that was probably uh, not the best idea. But, I mean, at least you quit for 10 years. So that, that's a good thing. Um, yes. How the story um, when ends. When I started you know, up, I lost everything. Yeah, exactly. That, and that's always what happens. That's the, the same story every time I talk to somebody like that. But uh, now, when you you started dating uh, way back when you were uh, you got a job corpse and you started clerical jobs and you started dating a guy and, and he was a, abusive too, wasn't he? Yes, um, I was when I was nineteen, um, almost twenty. Um, I got into a relationship with a gentleman uh-huh. that I met at work. Um, everything was great when we were dating until we moved in with each other, okay. and then his true colors showed. Um, I started. He started abusing me, controlling me, telling me where I could go, who I could talk to, what I could do. Mm, um, I literally was allowed to go to work and come home, and if I was five minutes late, I paid for it. Right. I've heard this story a bunch. Okay. So, um, I mm-hmm. finally got the courage to call the cops on him for the abuse okay. uh, when I was seven months pregnant. Uh, okay. So and they at that time, him? we were no longer dating, uh, but he did not like the fact that I had freedom and I was carrying his child. Oh. So they arrest him? Uh, so what had happened is um, he was at a halfway house. Um, called Fort Des Moines, and he had escaped from there and was hiding in my driveway. And I had come home with my best friend and another and her boyfriend, and he jumped out from behind the cars, and he started beating me. Um, my best friend went in and got her stepdad. He got him off of me, and he took off and went and flagged down a cop and brought the cop back to the house and was going to try to have my best friend's stepdad arrested for assault. And I told the cops, like, he was he was defending me. Um, I can't do this myself. And the cop looked at me. He's like, well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but you look like you can defend yourself. Um, I was a pretty big girl back then. Yeah. And I lifted my shirt up, and I showed him my belly. And he's like, um, how far along are you? I'm like, seven months. And you might want to call Fort Des Moines because I'm betting you he's not in his bed because he's in your car. 
And so he was arrested again, mm-hmm. and the judge sentenced him to two years for, to prison. By the well, time what he was going the... to be getting out, I got up and I left. I moved back to Sioux Falls to hide from him. Well, if you're seven months day. if you're seven months pregnant and you and you get a beating like that from a from a man, I mean, what happened with the baby? Was the baby all right, or what happened there? So he had actually um, punctured a uh, hole in my water bag, um, but the doctors took very good care of me. They kept a very close eye on me, um, and I ended up delivering three weeks early. Oh, okay. Because I was losing so much water. But the baby turned out okay then. Everything was fine. Uh, yep. Yeah, she um, she was healthy. Um, she was on the small side. Uh, she weighed five pounds, eight point eight ounces. Right. Right. Um, so, but as cute as could be. <laughs> okay. Could have been a lot worse, then for sure. It could yeah. have been, and I I thank God for for watching over me and protecting right. my baby. Well, well, I'll tell you what. You you uh, as a child, you're abused by your father. So you you took some beatings there. Then you get involved with this guy and. How long did that relationship go on? Um, so I was with him for, so we broke up, I was 22, so about three years. So you're with him for three years. My question is always, well, why why did you stay if you're getting beat all the time? Because I thought it was normal, um, because that's the life I grew up with. All I right. grew up being abused by a man, and I thought that that was the way things were. Well, what were, I mean, somebody beating you and mentally abusing you, what, what, were, your, what were your feelings at the time, you know, I mean, what, what were you thinking in your head about yourself? I was mad at God mm-hmm. because I always thought God was supposed to protect you. And why was God allowing these things to happen to me and allow this abuse to happen if he loved me? Mm-hmm. And so I lost my relationship with God when I was oh, probably 13, 14 years old. Mm-hmm. I no longer believed that God was protecting me because why was he allowing my dad to abuse me? And then yeah. when I was 19, why did he allow this guy to abuse me? Yeah, we kind of... Um, and then yeah, we kinda, I ended up marrying a man yeah. who abused me. Yeah, see, we kind of put ourselves in these situations. I mean, God obviously wants to protect us and do it, but if you jump off a cliff, you, I can I can probably be pretty sure that you're not going to have an angel swoop down and catch you midair. So, I mean, we we suffer from consequences that uh, that uh, of our own actions, you know, so we I understand where you're at. Um, mentally, I mean, you must have been thinking that uh, if you think it's normal, then you must have been thinking I'm no good. You know, I'm, you know, what, what were those my kind of thoughts? My self-worth, my self-esteem, my, how I thought of myself um, was bad. I didn't believe that I was worth anything. I didn't believe that I deserved anything good. Right. I believe that these things were happening to me because something I did and I was being punished for it. Right. But I didn't know what that was. Right. Well, you were pretty confused, for, for sure. So now this guy but, goes he goes uh, to prison, then he goes off to Texas, so he's kind of out of the picture. And so now you're, uh, you're a single mom again. You're working three jobs. Yep, uh, and, you, and going to college full-time. Right. To, what were you going to college for? Business administration oh, with the nice. emphasis of pre-law. There you go. Okay, good. So you're trying to get your I, act together. And, my goal was to go to law school. I see. Okay. Uh, but my dad made a comment to me, and it made a lot of sense. He told me that I'm a very argumentative person. I'm a very sassy, sarcastic person. And he said, you know, one day you're going to say something to a judge, and you're going to end up in jail for contempt of court. And I went, oh, yeah, and I won't have bail money. So let's just do something else. My goal was to own a business someday then. Okay. Well, you end up getting And now I own two. Oh, good. All right. Well, the, I know the story ends up better than what we're talking about now, but you meet another guy about then, and you get married, and he was abusing you just like uh, uh, yes. you, you know, the first one. But you said something that really caught my attention, and I've heard this from other uh, abused uh, ladies that, that have abusive husbands, and you just came to a point where you decided that you deserve better. And so you just mm-hmm. came into your mind that I don't deserve this anymore, and I got to do something about it. And that's that's kind of when that whole thing went down, right? Yes, um, okay. there was. It was, and I can remember the day to a T. We were arguing. My son was crying. I had ended up having two children with this man. Uh, my son was crying. He was not feeling very well, and I was trying to make him a bottle. And he told me I was doing it wrong, and so on and so forth. And. He said something to me 
that just went to the core. He said, someday I'm going to end up killing you. (laughs) And I crouched down into the kitchen, put my hands over my head because I knew he was going to hit me. And before he hit me, I grabbed the first thing I could, and it was a cast iron skillet, and I ran it up in between his legs. He hit the floor, and I grabbed my kids, and I ran. Ouch, ouch. Okay, well, that, that was a good move. So you got that out. That was my breaking point. Okay, great. So, well, not great, but great that you got out of it. So you got out of that situation, and uh, did you just move out, or what? You guys just... Um, I This guy didn't come back to get you again, house. did he? This guy didn't come back to get you like the first one, right? No. Okay, um, good. I went, I went back home two days later um, after things had calmed down, and I looked at him. I said, you know how I said I do? He's like, yeah. I said, well, I don't no more. Like, I want a divorce. I'm done. I'm over this. I can't do this no more. My life is so much more better if I live for me. All right. And um, I went to work, and when I came home, my kids were gone. Oh. So he, he took the kids? He had taken my children and oh. went to his mother's house. And in the state of South Dakota, whoever possesses 50% or more of the children's items gets the kids in a temporary hearing for a divorce. So you fought for quite a few years to get your kids back, I guess, and that didn't, even, did. get, that didn't even get worked out till they were like teenagers or something, right? Yep, until they were in high school. Yeah, so that was a long battle there. So that couldn't have worked well on your psyche, that's for sure. So, no, and it, yeah. it, it, I worked and work and work to be able to pay for an attorney to fight for my kids. Right. That was my main goal. Right. But somewhere along the line, I ended up with a mixed up friends and I started using again oh boy. in 2013. Okay. So now you're using meth again and uh, the, the, the second rape had just come along and, and you have this problem with going outside. So you're, you're staying you're staying inside all the time, and yep. uh, it, this part was, I have not heard this before, but you let your meth dealer move into your basement. Yes, so I did. So now you um, had your meth dealer down in the basement. access and, to me. Yeah. Well, I guess that's one way to take care of not going outside, right? Have your dealer move into it with, with you. All right, so that doesn't sound like a good situation. So, so the police know what's going on, I guess. There's people coming to buy drugs or something, and... Uh, yeah, a lot so I have traffic going house, in and out of my house all day, yeah. uh, all night, and my neighbors obviously noticed it, and they called the narc, narc department, and I did not know my house was being watched until the day I was arrested. Okay. Well, that that whole situation, um, I mean, if you want to, you were very fortunate. I mean, to get handcuffed, and then they let you go, and... Yeah. I mean, you could have you could have been in some serious trouble there. I mean, because they don't meth; they just despise meth paraphernalia, yep. dealers, anything with that. So, for them to let you go to where you had a chance to just get your head straight and 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 call uh, call a church to get some help that uh, that's amazing. But you've been seven there, years clean now, right? Yes, I'm seven years clean now. Right. Um, August eighteenth of twenty fourteen. Um, I just, that was it. I was done. Right. So, well, you got back into Celebrate Recovery, or you got into Celebrate Recovery, um, and so obviously that did you some clean. You got married again. He's 21 yeah, years yeah. clean or my something? My husband is uh, 21 years clean. Great. Uh, he has been my biggest supporter. Uh, he's been through so much with me. He was with me through the rape and through moving and everything. He supported me. He always told me, I love you. You're beautiful. You're worth everything. Ah. You deserve better. That's, and there you go. Now that's better than being abused, huh? That's the way it's supposed to be. So he, yeah. knows, he, knows, uh, he knows. We how don't to be argue um, yeah. for a long period of time. If it's an argument, we'll walk away and calm down and come back right. and talk about it that's rationally it. as adults. Right. Um, I don't ever have to worry about him raising hand to me. He doesn't very rarely raise his voice to me. Right. Like I really got lucky with this Excellent. one. He is my savior he's my hero excellent so uh he even, he goes to celebrate recovery with you too right he does he started excellent. um with me about six months after i started going he started going too all right now uh celebrate recovery has what they call step study a step study is where they go through the 12 steps but they do it as a group so everybody can move through together a little different than some of the secular ones where they just do it with you and a sponsor and you you've been through uh, a step study right I have. I've yeah. been through um, okay. three 
of oh, the books great. one through four. Okay. Well, what and I have done books five through eight twice. Well, what uh, what in the step study? What help help you deal with uh, the the things in the past? Because you have a lot of issues in the past with the abuse and your father and uh, mother leaving at three. And I, I mean, did that help you? You know, kind of let that go and and and. It did. It taught me that forgiveness isn't for them; it's for me, so that I can move on and I can have a a healthy relationship with myself and with others. I, I can apologize, whether they accept it or not. I have forgiven myself for things I did wrong. That's what I always tell somebody. You can't. You can't do anything about getting someone else to change themselves, but you you have to change yourself first. And, you know, a lot of women in abusive relationships just stay in them too long because they think it's their fault. They think they're no good. You know, this is what they deserve. All the things you were just telling me. But when you take a, a, a step in the right direction, you say, OK, look, I need to help myself. I need to change myself. This is not my fault. I am not, uh, uh, I don't deserve this. I, I'm not a bad person. You know, that's kind of what it, it did for you. So, yep. and my sponsor, she, um, because she had told me that some people you just can't go face to face with um, because it could be more detrimental to you. Um, so she had me write a letter to my first ex, abusive ex. Oh. And I did. And I apologized for this. And I told him that I forgive him for what he did to me. And, you know, I wish him the best in life and things like that. And I gave the letter to my sponsor. She never read it, but she shredded it. And she said, now, how do you feel? All right. Well, uh, that's that's a good way to do it. I've heard a lot of, of people doing that type of thing, and it always seems to help. It's kind of like just, you know, finally getting it out of your system and, and letting it go because people hang on to things for so many years. And it's just, it just, when you bottle stuff up and you just hang on to them forever, it just, it tears you apart from the inside out. When you find, it eats at you. Yes, exactly. And when you finally let it go, it's just like a ton of bricks off your chest and you feel it, okay, now I can live, you know? So, right, and I felt a weight off my shoulders that I never even knew was a weight. I just thought it was the way I was. But writing that letter to him, and being able to express everything that I felt and the forgiveness that I gave him and watching it get shredded, it just like, I could exhale. Right, exactly. Well, that's that's what it's all about. I, I, I appreciate you coming on the show and telling us your story. I know it's not easy to talk about and go back, but, you know, you're helping other people. That's one thing about recovery is that when you get recovery, you go back and help the people that are still having issues. You know, that's part of the whole deal. But... Uh, uh, you're going to recognize this because we do the serenity prayer at the end of every uh, show. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. So stick with us for a second. Uh, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is. Not as I would have it, would have trusting it. that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, to your will. so that I may be reasonably may happy, be in happy in this life and supremely happy with yeah. you forever in the next. No. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jen, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And, thank you. Uh, and uh, there'll be a lot of listeners out there that'll that'll take what you've said and, and, uh, and run with it for sure. So, Well, have... there's one thing that Melissa always told me. Okay. If I can just help one person then I've done what I need to do. If everybody thought that way, then the world would be a happier place, let me tell you, because that's all it takes. So, All right, well, thank you so much. We're going to uh, have, uh, well, now I kind of messed up my notes here. Sorry, folks, but we're going to have uh, uh, Christine next week from Missouri uh, talking about uh, being sex trafficked and the drugs that were involved and and. Uh, how that affected her and how she dealt with that, you know, as she became uh, became an adult. So that'll be, I don't think I've had, had anybody, Mariah, on the show that's been involved in sex trafficking before, but I know it's a big thing. So that'll be an interesting uh, interview there next week. So, yeah. All right. Well, uh, um, c- come see us next week. We're on every week, uh, new endings. And uh, my name is Darren. I'm your host every week. And uh, this is New Endings Radio. <laughs> <laughs>